Well, good morning. My name is Matt Stone. I'm one of the pastors here at Mount Pisgah Church, and I'm really glad to be in worship with you all today as we continue a series that we started last week called The Other Side. If you weren't with us last week, I hope you'll go back and watch it uh, because uh, uh, the story that unfolds in Mark's gospel, I think, is both fascinating, it's interesting on an intellectual level, but more importantly, spiritually, I think it's compelling and challenging. And so we're just working our way through that. Last week, we, uh, we looked at a story at the end of Mark chapter 4 where Jesus tells the disciples to get in a boat and, and go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Uh, while they're going to the other side, they encounter a storm. Uh, they think Jesus is asleep at the wheel. They say, Jesus, don't you care? Don't you care that we're dying out here? And Jesus says, of course I care. It's why I'm in the boat with you. And he calms the storm. And so we talked about what it means for us as followers of Jesus to make sure that we get in the boat with Jesus, even if we don't know where we're going, even if we don't know what's on the other side, as followers of Jesus, our only option is to get in the boat. Because if he's going over there, then that's where we need to go as well. And that's critically important for us, right? We all know what's coming in November. It's important in a season of division and tension and conflict for us to be willing to follow Jesus to the other side, to places and to people that we might not think are worth a journey, but Jesus clearly does. It's important for us to travel to the other side. It's also possible, by the way, that that means crossing the other side of the street from your home because the other side might be one of your neighbors. Uh, so we'll talk more about that later on this morning. So we're going to continue the journey by starting in, Lu in uh, Mark chapter 5, verse 1. It's the very next verse after the end of the story that we looked at last week. And this is one of those times where the chapter and verse marks are unhelpful. Remember, chapters and verses in Scripture were, were put in place hundreds of years after Scripture was written. Sometimes they got those breaks right. And sometimes they didn't. This is a good example of a time that they broke up a story by putting one in chapter four and one in chapter five when they shouldn't have broken it up because it makes us think that what starts at the beginning of Mark five is a completely new and disconnected story from what happened at the end of Mark four when nothing could be further from the truth. So this is a continuation of Jesus calming the storm last week and we're gonna, we're gonna make landfall in a hurry. This is Mark chapter five if you wanna follow along. I'm going to start in verse 1. It says, they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And we didn't even get out of verse 1, y'all. We didn't get out of verse 1 before. We need to go back to the map because we can't understand what's happening in the story without understanding where they came from and where they're going. So we're going to put the map up. It's the same map to begin with that we saw last week. Remember, we started with the disciples and Jesus on the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. That's the good side of the tracks. That's where observant Jewish folks live. That's where the kingdom of God is coming. We're following the laws. We're following the dietary commandments. We're, we're, not, uh, we're avoiding ritual impurity and pagan worship, all that stuff. We are following and looking for the kingdom of God. But this week... We landed on the other side of the Sea of Galilee, which is the east side of the southeast side in the country of the Gerasenes. This is a completely different space. It's not that we crossed a few miles. By the way, the Sea of Galilee is 13 miles north-south and about 8 miles east-west. So it's not a great geographic distance. But when Jesus and the disciples moved from the northwest side, from that evangelical triangle where he spent so much time, when they moved from that side to the east side, we may as well have crossed the Pacific Ocean. We're in a different world than we were on the northwest side. And here's what I mean by that. The country of the Gerasenes is in a region called the Decapolis. Deca means 10, polis means cities. It's 10 cities. These are 10 cities that Rome built. The Roman Empire built these 10 cities on the east side uh, and southeast side of the Sea of Galilee as a showcase for Roman power and authority uh, and wealth. And so what that meant is, it's a different world. The Roman 10th legion has occupied this part of Galilee. Remember that the promised land, the land that God gave to his people is occupied by Rome. The Roman 10th legion is there. Their, uh, their mascot, by the way, is the running boar, the running pig, like, like insult over injury to Jewish folks. Because I don't know if you know this, but pork and Jewish folks don't get along. So the running boar is the Roman 10th legion's mascot. Also, this is a place that is full of pagan temples, which means they are worshiping 
all kinds of pagan gods. There are, uh, there are theaters and stadiums there celebrating stories that have nothing to do with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There are bathhouses that work against every custom of modesty and purity in the Jewish culture. There is sexual immorality of every conceivable kind. This is Greco-Roman opulence at its greatest, in a way that cares nothing for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, or the son that that God sent. This is a different world. It could not be farther from the northwest side. It's so far from the good side of the tracks that it becomes known uh, and associated with like demonic activity. That's how far we are from the good side of the tracks, from the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee, uh, right? We're not talking about just the other side geographically. We're talking about the other side of the universe culturally and spiritually. And so before we even get into this story, as we start to locate it, we have an opportunity now, not really to know exactly where this story unfolded on the map, but now because we know the difference between this universe and this universe, Now we can start to locate this story in our own lives. Because let's be honest with ourselves. You don't have to be honest with me, but be honest with yourself. You know who the other side is in your life. It might be different for a lot of us, but you know who the other side is in your life. They are fundamentally different. They don't share any of your values. They don't share any of your, uh, of your concerns. They aren't headed in the right direction and they don't care what direction you're headed in because we can locate this story on that map. Now we can locate this story in the map of our own lives. So I want you to hear what happens as Jesus and the disciples make landfall because the truth is they shouldn't be there, right? That's the place that Jesus chooses to go. Are you serious? We left the kingdom of God on the northwest side to land in the, in the spiritual realm of evil? Jesus has no place over there. It's the last place we expect to find Jesus, much less his, much less his followers. And yet that's exactly where he makes landfall at the beginning of Mark chapter 1. And as soon as Jesus gets out of the boat, the disciples have the right to say, I told you so. Because a madman, a madman runs up to Jesus. And I don't think the disciples even get out of the boat yet because they see what's happening. We had a storm last night. We told you so, Jesus. We shouldn't have been out here. And now we get here and there's a madman that's running up to you. Jesus, we told you that we should not be here. Here's what we find out about this madman. He is, uh, he is full of an unclean or an evil spirit. This is a spiritual affliction that this man is facing. He is strong beyond measure, right? Nothing can contain him. Uh, the people in the Decapolis have tried to bind him with, uh, with ropes and with chains, and nothing can contain him. He is strong beyond measure. He comes out of the tombs. This man literally lives among the dead. And by the way, if you are a good and faithful Jewish man in the first century, you have no contact with the dead because that makes you impure. And for us, that sounds like a legalistic thing, but think of it in this way. When you have contact with the dead, you are putting a barrier between yourself and God. That's how they thought about it. You're putting a barrier between yourself and God. This man lives with the dead. That's how far away he is from God. He's strong beyond measure. He lives among the dead. It says that he is howling and screaming. Can you imagine what the disciples are thinking? As this howling and screaming, massively jacked guy runs up to Jesus. And it says that uh, Mark describes him as, uh, as cutting and bruising himself with stones. So this man is bleeding, he's screaming, and he's huge. And by the way, contact with blood. For a good and faithful Jewish person in the first century, same thing as contact with the dead. Right, that creates a, a barrier between you and God. Everything about this man says, we don't want any part of this. Mark tells us later on uh, that uh, everybody was surprised to see that he had clothes on, which means this man also was naked in a shame and purity culture. Now you have a naked, howling, bleeding, hugely strong man who runs up to Jesus. That's who this guy is. 
and he's full of an unclean spirit. I think the disciples look at that and say, no, no, thank you. I'm not getting out of this boat. I told you we shouldn't have come over here. I knew we shouldn't have come over here. Jesus, get back in the boat. I guarantee you that's what the disciples are saying. Jesus, get back in the boat. We don't want anything to do with this man. We shouldn't be here and we need to go back home because it's safe over there. We can stay in our enclave over there. We can stay in our protective bubble over there. This man is everything that God does not want for us. And yet, that's not what Jesus does. So friends, some of us, some of us in this room right now, connect more, connect less with the disciples and more with this madman. Because some of us know what it's like to be rejected by the world around us. Some of us know what it's like to be hurt beyond measure. Some of us know what it's like to despair of a future full of life. That's where this man must be. The last thing that we hear about him is that he lives in isolation. He lives by himself. He has been cut off from the community. That is what spiritual warfare, by the way, has a way of doing. It cuts us off from the people around us who might be able to help some of us relate more to this man than we do to the disciples. And if you're in that place, or perhaps you know somebody who's in that place, if that's where you are, I want you to hear what Jesus does next. Because what Jesus does next, he, he doesn't shy away, right? He doesn't turn away in disgust from this strong, howling, bleeding, isolated, naked, evil spirit filled man. He doesn't turn away from him. Instead, Jesus faces up and meets this man. He engages even that guy. So if you're in that place, I want you to hear the exchange that Jesus has with him. He walks up and and he addresses, the, the man addresses Jesus and he says, Jesus, son of the most high God. How fascinating, by the way, that the spirit within this man evil though it is, knows who Jesus is. Jesus, son of the most high God, I adjure you, I I beg you is what he says, not to torment me. And he says that because Jesus has already told him, he's already uh, commanded the spirit to come out of the man. Jesus's concern is not for the spirit. His concern is for the man. He's already commanded the spirit to come out of the man. And so the spirit begins to beg Jesus, don't torment me. Don't kick me out. Don't make me leave this country. There is something about that spirit that wants to to cling to the other side because it knows that folks on the right side think there's no hope for folks on the other side. That spirit wants to cling and Jesus' response, he says, well, well, what's your name? And the spirit answers, legion, for we are many. And he begs Jesus again, don't kick us out of the country. The spirit looks around and he sees a swine herd, right? A herd of pigs, 2,000 pigs. I've never seen that many pigs. I don't know what that would look like, but it seems impressive. He sees 2,000 pigs. And so the Spirit says to Jesus, cast us into those pigs. And Jesus gives permission for the evil spirit to leave the man and inhabit these pigs, right? If Jesus is the one given permission, by the way, Jesus is the one who has the authority and the power in this situation. It's Jesus who has the power to expel that evil and unclean spirit from the man. And that's exactly what he does. And he sends the spirit into this swine herd of 2000 pigs who begin running down the cliff. And at this point, I want to remind you, what is the mascot of the Roman 10th legion? The people who have taken control of God's land, the people who have taken control of the promised land, what's their mascot? the running pig. And here we see an evil spirit cast out of this man and cast into 2,000 running pigs who descend into the Sea of Galilee, right there where it says Gergisa. They descend into the Sea of Galilee off the cliff and they drown in the Sea of Galilee. Don't sleep. Don't sleep on the fact that one one of the things that we hear in this story 
is Jesus is the one with both the authority and the power over both a spiritual realm and a temporal realm. It's Jesus who has power over evil. Evil cannot overcome Jesus. Darkness cannot overcome the light. That's what John tells us. Evil cannot overcome Jesus. And the same is true of the Roman Empire and every other earthly empire. They cannot overcome the power of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's one of the things that we hear in this story. The pigs run off. They die in the Sea of Galilee. The swine herds, God bless them, are left with no swine. And so they go into the countryside, they go through the Decapolis, and they tell everybody, hey, y'all got to come see this because this is bad news, right? Jesus has just destroyed their financial base, or at least part of it. See, it's a huge economic resource that has just flung themselves to, to their own death in the Sea of Galilee. So the swineherds bring the whole community to see what's happened, and you can imagine that they have a bit of an edge because they've heard that all their money is now dead and floating in the Sea of Galilee. And what they find is that this madman is now clothed and in his right mind, is what Mark says. He's clothed and in his right mind. And they look at that, and they look at the pigs that are dead, and they beg Jesus to leave. It's exactly what we don't expect, right? For us, we're a little too familiar with Jesus to connect with their experience, I think. But remember, this man's destroyed their financial base. He's also subdued this madman that none of them had the strength to bind and subdue. They don't know who Jesus is. They don't know what power Jesus is using. And because of that, it generates fear. And friends, that's exactly what folks around us at times experience when confronted with God. They're afraid of it because they don't know it. And so they begin to beg Jesus, Jesus, leave. You got to get out of here. It's not okay for you to be here. You've ruined our economy and we're not sure how much power you have or what you're going to use it to do. So you have got to go. It's fascinating to me that Jesus says, okay, it's not what I expect. Again, it's not what I expect. I expect Jesus to say, I'm planting my flag right here. And I don't care what you say. I came here with a purpose and I'm here to stay. That's what I want Jesus to say. But it's not what he says. He begins to get back in the boat. It's as though he is content with what he has begun. Knowing that he is not finished. Knowing that he will return to that shore to finish what he began. And so he begins to get in the boat. And that's typically where we stop reading this story. It's what happens next that I find so compelling. And again, I think this is compelling for all of us. Some of us know what it's like to be this madman, rejected by the world, right? Perhaps we don't know what it's like to be filled with an unclean or an evil spirit, but we know what it's like to feel like there's no hope. We know what it's like for people to hold us at arm's length. We know what it's like to feel like we're a pariah and nobody really wants us around. You need to hear what happens next. And some of us are the disciples with Jesus looking at this saying, well, now I don't know what to do because I was pretty sure we weren't supposed to be here in the first place. And now I've seen Jesus do something I never expected. And I don't know what to do with it. Here's what happens at the end of this story. This is in Mark 5, verse 18. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed by demons begged Jesus that he might be with him, right? This man wants to go with Jesus. This man wants to go back to the northwest side of the Sea of Galilee. He wants to go back to the safety, to the enclave, to the place where other people are looking for God, where other people are looking for the Messiah. He does what we want to do. When we have an encounter with God, right, when we have that spiritual experience where we meet God in worship or on a retreat or in our homes, we want to stay there. We want to stay with Jesus. That's what this man's experiencing. It's perfectly natural. It's what you and I experience too. We want to go back with Jesus, wherever it is that Jesus is going. We want to go with him. And so we expect Jesus to say, great, get in the boat. We got an extra seat because that's what Jesus always says. Come on with me. And that's what Jesus doesn't say in this case. But Jesus refused 
and said to him in verse 19, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and what mercy he has shown you. Go home to your friends. You can't come. Go home to your friends. Go home to your family and tell them what the Lord has done for you. Tell them about the mercy shown to you. Tell them about the healing that you've experienced. Isn't it interesting? In the context of spiritual warfare that tends to isolate us and cut us off from the community, the work of Jesus brings us back to family. The work of Jesus brings us back to community so that we can tell the story over and over. This is one of my absolute favorite stories in all of Scripture for this reason. It's both the gospel and one of the core expectations for followers of Jesus. Right? This story is the gospel. If you feel like that, like that madman, if you know what it's like to have no hope in your life, you need to hear that Jesus crossed every chasm. He crossed the sea just for you. Jesus made that journey from one world to another for one man. And that's what he's willing to do for you. Whatever it is that's going on in your life, whatever it is that went on in your life, if you feel like you're too far, then you need to know if this man isn't too far for Jesus to travel, then you aren't either. And Jesus is coming for you. Not to judge you, not to beat you up, not to shame you, but to do for you what he did for this man to heal you and bring you wholeness, to bring you back to life. This story is the gospel in 19 short verses. And this story, for those of us who are trying to follow Jesus, is one of the core commissions of the gospel. It's one of the core commandments for followers of Jesus. Get in the boat. Go to the other side and get out of the boat. Don't get in the boat, go to the other side and go right back home. That's what the disciples wanted to do. And that's what Jesus shows them how not to do. Go to the people that you think have no hope. Go to the people that you think God is angry at. Whoever that is in your life, if they live next to you, go next door. If you work with them, go to the cubicle next to you. Go to the people that you already kind of secretly believe. There's no way God likes them. If there's somebody like that in your life, they're on the other side. And Jesus is coming for them. And if Jesus is coming for them, what are you going to do? Not go? That's not an option. Jesus didn't let half the disciples stay back while the rest of them went. He took all of them because the work demands all of us. Brothers and sisters, this story is not only the gospel, it's how to live. Whether we're approaching an election or a neighbor or a coworker, whether the other side is rich folks or poor folks, whether the other side is liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans, whether the other side is Calvinists or Arminians, whatever the other side is, Jesus is calling you to go to them because no domain is left unclaimed by Jesus. No land and no people are left untouched by the flag Jesus plants in the ground and says, they belong to me too. And if they belong to Jesus, then for better or worse, they belong to us. They're our brothers and sisters, whether they know it yet or not. So get in the boat, make the journey, and then get out. Let's pray. God, we give you thanks for this story about crossing the sea. We're grateful, O oh God, that, that you have crossed every barrier that stands between us and you. 
Not because we earned it, God. Not because we deserve it, but because you wanted us. You wanted a relationship with us. In spite of our own brokenness, in spite of the ways that we rebelled against you, in spite of the ways that the world has rejected us, you came for us. And we praise you, Lord, that this stands at the heart of who you are, at the heart of the good news that your son came to proclaim. God, I pray as we begin to look at the world around us, as we see folks that we secretly suspect you might not like, that we secretly suspect you want no part of. God, I pray that you would convict us. Convict us of your love for them. Soften our hearts, Lord. That we might go out and encounter people of all backgrounds, of all convictions, of all demographics and see them with the eyes of Jesus who encountered this madman with love and compassion with a desire to heal and restore send us out O oh God we pray all this in the name of your son Jesus Christ Amen